Good morning, St. Luke's. It is October the 18th. We're sheltering in place. We're sheltering in God. It is week 30. There's a classic line in our text this morning. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. It's a, it's a memorable phrase, isn't it? Render unto Caesar. And the first hearers were astonished and amazed when Jesus said that. Although, when you read the whole passage, it's not entirely clear what he means. Give to God the things that are God's. It's like, well, what does God want from us? Would it be too simplistic to say God wants the same thing we do from our children, from our spouse, from our partner, from our friends? Would that be too simplistic? I mean, after all, if we're made in God's image, there has to be some similarity somewhere. What's important, Jesus taught, is what's important is learning how to love God, which looks like learning how to love people well. And I think that includes this beautiful earth garden that we inhabit, along with the most amazing creatures big and small. Give to God the things that are God's. The Gospel reading today is from Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. Good morning, children of St. Luke's. Have you ever been asked to pick a side? In the reading today, Jesus was in that position. The Pharisees were hoping to trip him up with a trick question. They asked Jesus if they should pay taxes to Caesar, who was the ruler in Rome at that time. This question was supposed to make him pick a side, but his answer surprised them. He says to give Caesar or give to the government what belongs to them and give to God what belongs to God. So what do you think belongs to God? We could say that everything belongs to God and that what we have, God gives us to use to care for ourselves and others. We have an offering time at every worship service even as we worship online. An offering is a way we give something in the name of our faith and our worship, knowing that what we have comes from God. So when we take up our offering each week, it goes to several different places. Some of it pays the bills at our church. Some of it goes outside of our church, like when a hurricane or an earthquake happens and people need shelter and food. Some goes to local charities like the homeless some to families who are struggling financially. We do these things because we know that this is how God wants us to treat others. We should always remember that everything we have comes from God. So let's thank God for all those things. Dear Lord, we are thankful to you for keeping our families and our friends safe and healthy. We are thankful for all the blessings you give us and we ask you to help us to share them to make a difference in others' lives. In Jesus' name, amen. When we consider our spiritual lives, many of us are, we're looking to our faith for answers, aren't we? I mean, we're, we look to God for guidance. That's a big part of who we are as people of God. You know, it's why we listen to teachings. It's why we read books of a spiritual nature 
or um, any kind of spiritual discipline you do, we're kind of looking for answers. We're looking for guidance. We're hoping that when we listen to a teaching or when we read a scripture or we're in a Bible study, we're, that we're going to leave a little bit wiser, that it will inform us in some way. And, uh, and so when we, when we listen to any teaching, at the back of our mind, you know, we're always sort of working through our lives. And we're thinking about this problem at work, or we're thinking about how can I, how can I live in such a way that I won't be so stressed, or how how can I make this change? So we're listening to the teaching, and then at the back of our mind, we're filtering it through whatever the dilemma is that we're worried about. Should I speak to this person and tell them what's on my mind? What should I do about money? What would be a good financial decision here? All these things were. We're hoping that God will reveal truth to us, give us a way forward. Um, and, you know, you've noticed this, that it's not always easy to figure out how God is leading. It's not always clear. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's, it's really not that clear how God is leading. In other words, you'll have a problem and it will stay with you a while. Well, one of the things to know is that, and you probably noticed this already, that Jesus isn't the kind of teacher that gives easy, pat answers. It's not so much, this is right, this is wrong, this is black, this is white. You know, it's very, very clear which way. And this is a great text that shows this this morning, that uh, Jesus works in the realm of principles. And he gives out principles. This is why they've lasted thousands and thousands of years, because they're not specific to particular times. They're spiritual principles that are passed down throughout the generations. But by the time we get the principles, we still have to work them out for ourselves with the help of the Holy Spirit. So that's why there's always that part of our spiritual life where we're a little bit unsure. The principles need to be worked through and worked out in our daily lives. Jesus gives us the principle, but then after that, it's like, now you've got, you have to think about this. You have to work this through with the help of the Holy Spirit and come to a conclusion for yourself. So this morning we have a story that, an encounter that is, uh, as Dorothy just read this, it's a bit of a trap. It's always good to know if Jesus is in conversation, who is it that he's actually speaking to? Because if he's speaking to his enemies, it's going to sound very different than if he's speaking to someone who's asking for help. This is a conversation with his enemies, the Pharisees. They were the religious leaders of the day. They did not like him at all. And I've always said that I've found it it's kind of strange and fascinating in some at some level, that the people that disliked Jesus the most were the religious leaders of the day, the church of the day. Uh, as they listened to him, as, they, as the Pharisees listened to his teaching, they concluded rightly that he wasn't like any other rabbi, and he wasn't. And the reason that he wasn't like any other rabbi was because in Jesus' day, rabbis would quote other rabbis and that's how the teachings of the elders would go down from generation to generation so you would have a rabbi and they would say well this is what rabbi Yaakov says or whatever and then they would pass the message down now when Jesus came along rabbi Jesus never quoted other rabbis he would say things like you have heard it said but I say to you so he took on a different kind of authority altogether. He never quoted from other rabbis. He would say, I'm saying, I'm saying these things to you. I'm giving you this. So this was very challenging for the Pharisees. And at, at this point in Jesus' ministry, because this is near the end of his ministry, they're ready to have him arrested. They're at the end of the, their terror. So if, if you're familiar with the chronological life of Jesus, this would be after he 
went into Jerusalem on that palm, what we have come to call Palm Sunday, it would be after that. It would be after the cleansing of the temple. So we're at the tail end now of his life. So Jesus didn't have any problem challenging the Pharisees' understanding of scripture. He challenged their understanding of God. And at this point, the antagonism is at a peak. Now, living in the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago, vastly different from living in North America today. Uh, and I have mentioned before that there was this home, the, the homeland was under foreign occupation. So most of us can just imagine how that would be. You paid your taxes, your imperial tax was paid to Caesar, once a year, one denarii, an imperial tax that went to support the ancient Roman troops that kept you oppressed. So you can imagine how much that imperial tax was absolutely hated. And just to make it worse, just to make it even, you know, more intolerable, the denarii, the coin, had a stamp of Tiberius Caesar's head on it with the engraving around the coin, son of God. I mean, you can imagine how offensive that would be to a follower of the way. And I mean, that's the worst thing ever, right? You've got your coin with Tiberius Caesar's head on it, son of God, and you have to pay that coin to Tiberius so that the troops could keep you oppressed. I mean, it's awful. By the time Matthew writes down his gospel, and this is from Matthew's gospel, Christianity was illegal and uh, severe persecution and death was not uncommon. So for these New Testament, early New Testament believers, you know, paying your taxes was a really painful reminder that you lived in a land you were not free. You were not free to... Um, follow Jesus the way you would want to. You could get into a lot of trouble. So this particular encounter uh, with the Pharisees goes like this. They begin with flattery. Actually, did you notice that it was the Herodians and the Pharisees that came to Jesus with a question? That's highly unusual. I mean, the, the, the Herodians supported Roman governance, the Pharisees didn't. And this is actually quite political. Um, so it would be like, uh, you know, the Herodians and the Pharisees team up together to get, to get Jesus. They never teamed up for anything, you know, because they're two completely different political parties, so to speak, working together to try and trap Jesus. Look, when did two opposing political parties ever work together? Not too well, not too often, right? As we know, same thing in Jesus' day. So the Herodians come, the Pharisees come, they begin with flattery, verse 16. Teacher, Rabbi, we know that uh, you don't change your teach teachings to suit people. So tell us, according to scripture, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? There's the, there's the trap. If he says, yes, pay the taxes, all sorts of people are going to be saying, can you believe Rabbi Jesus says that we have to go along with this corrupt government? Can you believe that Rabbi Jesus says that we, that we have to hand over the coin that says, son of God with Tiberius' head on it? And that's not an issue for Jesus? What kind of a rabbi is this? It, on the other hand, if he says, don't pay your taxes, his enemies are going to say he, he needs to be arrested. He's, he's going against the government. He's going against Rome. So he's sort of stuck in that awkward place where you can't say yes and he can't say no without getting into trouble. And Jesus often will not be boxed into yes or no answers, which I think is something that we can learn from ourselves because so many times people want to know, where do you stand on this? Where do you stand on that? What, do you believe this? Do you believe that? Sometimes it isn't a yes or a no. Sometimes the answer might be, we need to have some conversation. 
I need to know the context, you know. So anyway, back to the text. Jesus doesn't say yes or no. He says, show me the coin. They give him the denarii. And he said, Who's, whose head is on that coin? Well, it's Tiberius. Tiberius Caesar. Verse 21, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Give to God the things that are God. Now, from our 21st century North American point of view, we might read that as a very clear, simple separation of church and state. However, I'm not, I don't think that's what it is. And the reason that I don't think that's what it is is because that's a relatively new thing historically for people to think that way. The ancient people didn't think in terms of two realms. They just, Jesus, uh, the ancient Jews and Hebrews, they didn't think of having two realms. It wasn't in their mindset. That was a later historical development. So he says, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, give to God the things that are God. Now, when you first hear this, so I'm thinking that you might think, oh, it looks like there's Caesar's world and there's Caesar's ways, the worldly ways, and then there's God's world and then there's God's ways. So you could read it as give to Caesar what Caesar, so pay your taxes, be a good citizen. And But it's this next line here, give to God what is God's. This is the tricky part of this. Give to God what's God's because what belongs to God? What belongs to God? Or here's another way, what doesn't belong to God? You see it's a, how it's a tricky, it's a tricky verse, isn't it? Because it's like, well, everything belongs to God, ultimately. The one who holds the cosmos together, I mean, ultimately, everything belongs to God, right? So it's like, okay, maybe Jesus isn't dividing up reality between Caesar's realm, the world, the political realm, and God's realm, the religious realm, the church realm. Maybe it's not that. Maybe it's not that. Give to God what's God's. Well, if everything belongs to God, if there's, if there's nothing that doesn't belong to God in the sense that God influences all things, here's an interesting line from a theologian. William Loder says, if everything is God's, if we can agree with that, that everything ultimately is God's, then in all things I will seek God's will. And that will entail measuring all things including governments, by the vision that Jesus has given us of God's rule or kingdom. It's a way of saying, when you follow Christ, when you're a follower of Christ, you look at everything through that lens to see whether something is helpful or not helpful or good or bad or right or wrong. Everything is measured through that lens of this is what Jesus taught, this is Jesus' way. There's no division in other words. There's no division. God's every bit as much in the office as God is in a sacred space somewhere like a church or whatever we would see as sacred you know god is every bit as much in a school as a hospital uh, or in a sanctuary there is no one place that god is more god than another if that makes sense uh, God's not more present in a church sanctuary than your home. It doesn't work that way. God isn't parceled up that way. So really, Jesus is reminding us that it was like Jesus is saying, well, maybe you do divide God up. Maybe you do see God more here than more there. Um, well, 
maybe that's the way that you think, but that's actually not the reality. Jesus is teaching. You know, it's, it's the idea that in some sense, I think what spiritual maturity is, is that you take your whole self with you wherever you go and you're always the same. There isn't, there isn't one space where you're a sort of pious religious person and then another space where you're, you know, something else and then another, then you have your work life here and then you've got your family life here and then you've got your church life here. You said, mm, no, you're the same person wherever you are. There isn't one face for one and one face for another. Life isn't divided up that way. You're not divided in yourself. You're always the same person. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter who you're with. Your, your values are always the same. Your character is always the same. Um, wherever you go. There's no division. Give to Caesar what Caesar's. God what's God's. Your allegiance is to God. God is the one. God is the one you trust. God is the one you staked your very life upon. That's how to live. It's like I sometimes when I read this text, I think about what Jesus would say today. And, you know, on our coins, of course, we have that little line in God we trust in our coins. And this is purely my imagination, but I often think of Jesus, what he would say about our coin with that engraved in it, because, you know, it's got in God we trust. And, you know, knowing Jesus, and, you know, once you, once you listen to his teachings a while, you can sort of imagine how he would interact with that, you know, in God we trust. It was like, I can imagine Jesus saying, oh, that's well, cool you have that in your coin, do you? Do you? Do you trust in God? You know, do you trust that God is is working in your life in all areas? And I mean all areas. Not just in a sanctuary somewhere or a holy place somewhere. But, you know, are you trusting God enough? Are you following Christ in, in every place you are, in every space you are? Are you learning how to forgive? Because that was... That was what it looked like to follow Jesus. Are you learning how to release anger and not be bowed down with anger? Because that's what following Jesus looks like. Um, are, you, are you learning how to, to lead a generous life? Well, why? Because that's what it looks like to follow Jesus. That's what it looks like to walk in the way. Um, are you learning how to protect your time and your energy so that God doesn't get squeezed out? Because you're just too busy with other things. Why? Well, it's because that's what it looks like. That's what he modeled. That's what he taught. You know? Are you making sure your children and your grandchildren are following in the way? Why? Because one day you might not be there and they need someone a lot bigger and stronger that can always be there for them. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's what it looks like. It's like, in God we trust. It's like it's even on our coin today. It's like in every area, there's the heart cry. There's the heart cry, you know. Am I doing this? God, would you help me in every area? Because it's hard. It's so much easier to divide things out. It's so much easier to just have two worlds. But it's like, no, it's in every area of our life. So there's our heart cry this morning. God, help me to trust you in every area, especially the one or two areas that have really been getting me down this week. Because there's a good possibility there's one or two areas that you struggle with. And that's the area that we want to learn how to trust. Amen.
I'd like to thank everyone who has helped us out financially this week. Not just financially, I want to thank those of you who pray for us. That's a huge thing too. But I do want to acknowledge those of you who have put your uh, envelopes through our letterbox. We never, we never know who that is. And we, we do get the cash gifts through the letterbox too. And your checks and we got your bank. Uh, those of you who have asked your bank to send us money, it was all received. I want to thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your ongoing faithfulness over these last few months. Amen. <laughs>